organized this panel to discuss cross-border data flow protection and the appropriate mechanisms such as free trade agreements and treaties and whether or not these vehicles will work for achieving those goals. With that, I'd like to introduce the chair of our panel, Frederick. Frederick is a researcher at the Instru Institute for Information Law at the University of Amsterdam, researching profiling, privacy, and freedom of speech. In the spring of 2015, his first book will be published, titled Importing, Improving Privacy Protection in the Area of Behavioral Targeting. Frederick has published widely on topics such as data protection law, privacy, and copyright. He has presented at international conferences and at the Dutch and European parliaments. Frederick? Thank you very much, David. I'll um, uh, introduce all the panel members now, and then we'll go to brief presentations, and then we'll invite uh, the public, you, to join us um, in the discussion. First, the gentleman that you just heard is um, David Fall, an assistant professor in information sciences and law at the University of Pittsburgh, but he's also a fellow at the Information Society Project at Yale. Um, he looks, or his research looks mainly at uh, uh, regulation and impact of new technologies with special focus on topics like cybersecurity and privacy. Then all the way on that side, there's um, Mr. Joris van Hoboke. Um, he's now at uh, New York University, NYU, where he works um, uh, dually at the Information Law Institute and the Department for Media, Culture and Communications. So he works on the intersection of those two disciplines. And um, uh, he focuses mostly on privacy and freedom of expression. For instance, in 2012, he obtained his uh, doctorate at the University of Amsterdam with a book on search engines and freedom of expression. And lately, he has been examining, among other topics, um, privacy protection in the context of cloud computing, especially in the light of uh, transnational surveillance. Then, next to Joris, we have um, Eduardo Ustaran, um, a partner at Hogan Lovels, uh, working in the global privacy and information management practice. He is um, duly qualified as a lawyer, both in Spain and in England, and nowadays based in London. Uh, he advises some of the world's leading companies or largest companies on data privacy issues. And Eduardo is also closely involved with the development of the new European data protection framework. He's a busy man. He's also a member of the board of directors of the International Association of Privacy Professionals. And he has written several books, most recently, The Future of Privacy in 2013. Um, then here we have um, Mr. Pierre-Luigi Perry, an associate research professor of computer law at the University of Milan, a former visiting fellow at the uh, Information Society project of the Yale Law School. And uh, his research focuses mostly on privacy and data security, and in particular on health data and location data. And he's also a lawyer member of the Milan Bar. And here next to me is uh, Professor Kaminsky, a law professor at Ohio State University. She teaches privacy and intellectual property. She's a graduate from Harvard and Yale, and she publishes widely on uh, law and technology in both the academic and the popular press. And I immediately give the floor to uh, Margot. Let me just make sure this is on. Okay, so thank you very much for having us, uh, and a second thank you to the Yale Information Society Project for sponsoring this panel. I realize on the surface of things, it looks like we don't have anybody from the Yale Information Society Project here, but I in fact ran it for three years, and David and Pierluigi are also alumni and affiliates. Um, thank you also to our other illustrious panelists and to Frederick for moderating.
And as you'll notice from the program, we were supposed to have both Joan Antical um, and Joel Reidenberg with us, but they are both, for different reasons, unable to join us. Um, so thanks to them for actually helping to frame this conversation, even though they are physically absent. So I'm going to cover three topics. The first, I'm actually going to be a stand-in for Joel um, and talk a little bit about his framing of EU-US harmonization, because his work in the late 90s, early 2000s was a large inspiration for the topic of this panel. Then I'll talk briefly about the right to be forgotten as the most current illustration of the EU-US philosophical split over privacy. And finally, I'll talk about political process a little bit and whether privacy should be harmonized through free trade agreements, such as the currently negotiated TTIP. So in 2000, uh, which was very soon after the Data Protection Directive was implemented um, and around the time of safe harbor negotiations, Joel Reidenberg wrote in Stanford Law Review that EU-US privacy differences are far deeper than substantive disagreement over privacy. He said that privacy illustrates fundamentally differing norms about democratic governance and the role of the state. The US has a bias toward liberal norms and regards the state with suspicion and so takes a market approach to privacy governing primarily through private contract. The EU, by contrast, governs according to social protection norms and envisions the state as a necessary player that creates the community against which individuals thrive. So boiling that down to a much more simplistic summary, the, in the EU, you trust the government more than the private sector. In the US, we trust the private sector more than the government. So Joel, writing in 2000, said that the EU-US safe harbor will inevitably be an inadequate interface because there was inadequate process in its negotiation. He said that the only way to resolve fundamental differences over differing governance norms is through the institutional process of negotiating a real international treaty. So what matters for him is not just the substantive convergence over privacy, it's the process of arriving at norms convergence, um, which involves a great deal of legitimacy and engagement through a de democratic process. So Joel proposed establishing an international institutional process of norm development and privacy, which would, in the short term, facilitate coexistence of the different regimes, and in the long term, end up eventually arriving at some form of norms convergence. He argued at the time that, based on the existence of the TRIPS agreement in the World Trade Organization as a model, that the best place to do this institutionally would be through a trade agreement. So I have twofold responses to this argument, and I will also point out this is what he thought in 2000 and not necessarily what he thought today, and he's not here to reply to me, so it's not fair. Um, my first response is on substance, and the second response is about political process. On substance, I think Joel was mostly correct that EU-US privacy differences do illustrate fundamentally different understandings of the role of the state in democratic governance. And you can see this with the right to be forgotten. The EU right to be forgotten, as many of you probably have already discussed, uh, won't fly in the United States. In the US, there's a strong prioritization of free flow of information, otherwise known as freedom of speech or First Amendment protections, over protection of individual privacy. You can see this in both US jurisprudence and in US regulation. In jurisprudence, there are a series of cases at the Supreme Court where the Supreme Court decided that rape shield laws, which protect the name, names of rape victims from publication in newspapers, were unconstitutional, thereby prioritizing free, freedom of expression on the parts of the newspapers and newspaper readers over the privacy rights of rape victims. Uh, on the regulatory side, Congress enacted CDA 230, which immunizes online intermediaries from liability for things that are posted uh, through their websites or through their programs. And both of these things can be understood as really being about the role of government. The US is prioritizing a vision of a non-intrusive state that allows information to flow, where the EU, by contrast, is protecting positive individual liberties and protecting privacy. But I think that focusing solely on governance differences makes the two systems look more different than they actually are because there is an area of US law 
a much maligned area of U.S. law, but it exists nonetheless, um, where the U.S. government does prioritize protection of individual rights over free flow of information, and that would be copyright law. Again, you see this switch in both U.S. jurisprudence and U.S. regulation. Jurisprudentially, at the Supreme Court, the U.S. crafted an interface between copyright and the First Amendment, where copyright protection actually can win over the First Amendment. And regulatorily, Congress has the notice and takedown system that was enacted in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, known as the DMCA. Plus, there's been a fascinating trend in the U.S. recently of privacy issues being characterized by victims as copyright issues to take advantage of that particular regulatory approach. You see this with the Ninth Circuit case of Garcia versus Google, um, and you see this with the recent response of celebrities to the hacking that took place in September where their photos were stolen from the iCloud. So I'm certainly not saying that the U.S. copyright system is better than how the U.S. treats privacy. I'm just saying that it illustrates that EU-US differences can't solely boil down to differences over envisioning the role of a state. And they must be to some extent about differences over substantive understandings of privacy and the relative weight of privacy when you put it up against free speech. So I would be more optimistic than Joel about the possibility of future convergence uh, through whatever process because I don't think we're dealing with shifting understandings of the role of the state, which is very fundamental. I think we're dealing with shifting understandings about a substantive area of law. So my second point of response to Joel, who remains invisible, um, is that if you agree with him that we should have an international privacy agreement of some kind, in part because substantive harmonization is a good, and in part because the process of negotiating will itself encourage convergence, Trade agreements, Joel says, are the way to go. And I say absolutely not. Um, this is particularly topical because even though Joel was arguing this in 2000, because of the ongoing negotiations of the TTIP agreement between the US and the EU. EU representatives, as recently as January 19th, have publicly stated that data protection is not on the TTIP agenda. So there are at least three indicators that, that point to a different story. Indicator number one is that there's a strong movement of U.S. interest groups to lobby on including privacy and data protection in trade. Indicator number two is that data protection related negotiating objectives have appeared in U.S. Tr proposed U.S. trade legislation. It hasn't been enacted yet, but the negotiating objectives were in the proposed version of the law. And three, data localization provisions have been included in e-commerce chapters in previous U.S. free trade agreements. So in as much as data processing localization is key to the EU framework, that's something that the US is actually going and negotiating about with other countries. So three things suggest to me, based on my work on IP and trade agreements, that data protection should not be in trade agreements. First is because free trade agreements, in free trade agreements, issues get bundled. So let's say you have a privacy chapter, a textile chapter, a cattle chapter, and I don't know, like a tattoo chapter. All of those different interest groups want the agreement to be passed. So if you have problems with what's in the privacy chapter, it's very unlikely that that will stall the entire agreement that the textiles, cattle industry, et cetera, et cetera, all want to have passed. The second reason it's an inappropriate location for privacy negotiations is that the free trade theor theoretical framing ignores human rights. It, it biases towards an economic framing with a strong bias towards harmonization, and often harmonization through deregulation at the expense of any human rights concerns. And three, the reason that, third reason why free trade is not a good place for talking about data regulation is actually specific to features of the US trade negotiating system. So without getting too into that in great detail, the US negotiates trade agreements very differently than it negotiates treaties in terms of the amount of democratic process that happens domestically in the United States. When the US negotiates free trade agreements, it's through a fundamentally closed process, not subject to freedom of information laws or public revelation. And they combine that closed secrecy with privileged access for certain private sector individuals who have access to both the text and to negotiations. And there's minimal to no public interest involvement on the US side. 
So that makes the process of negotiations of trade agreements in the US particularly subject to capture by private industry, gr industry groups with economic interests. So this means overall substantive free trade agreements have a, negotiate, have a bias towards a particular result. And in the process, trade negotiations with the US would be the opposite of this gradual consensus building process that Joel Reidenberg advocates through an international treaty. So in summary, yes, EU-US privacy differences can be traceable to different understandings of governance, and the right to be forgotten illustrates this to a certain extent, but copyright regulation in the US suggests this is not just about governance, this is also about substantive understandings of privacy, which gives me more hope for possible future convergence over substantive understandings. And as far as consensus building through international negotiations goes, free trade agreements are not the place to try to harmonize privacy. They have features that make it much more likely that the trade approach will end up with a deregulatory US company favoring approach to data protection instead of appro the approach protecting the rights of individual citizens. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Margot, and also for your impeccable time management. Um, this brings us to the second speaker, uh, Joris van Hoboken. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers at the OISP for having me on this panel. I was going to make a few brief remarks, um, three, three remarks, three sets. Uh, first of all, on uh, the connection between data protection and trade from a European perspective, then I want to say something about, unpack a little bit uh, uh, the idea of Europe as a unity or not um, in that relationship also with the United States. And I wanna find, uh, I'm gonna finish off with some remarks on the growing divide of, uh, between US and Europe on how to balance privacy and freedom of expression. So on the connection between data protection and trade from a European perspective, I think clearly looking historically, this is a very strong one, looking at, and with Europe meaning the European Union, um, the whole reason for having a privacy uh, instrument at European level, the directive from 95, was trade related, was about completion of the internal market. And I think that's very important to have, to have in mind when we think about uh, the, um, the current uh, debate about uh, trade and data protection. And I think in many ways, um, the proposals for, for a regulation are informed also by the completion of this project of establishing an internal market in Europe. And in addition to that, maybe also um, uh, looking at Europe in a more international perspective and the idea of having actually uh, establishing conditions for, for industry to operate in Europe and have a, uh, a more, um, a better harmonized uh, European framework of data protection. So uh, with that, we have a, a particularly strong connection uh, within already the data protection framework in Europe and the establishment of privacy norms in Europe with, with trade and uh, the conditions for doing business and, uh, and establishing certain conditions for cross-border data flow. Uh, there's one complicating factor, however, more recently, of course, with um, the anchoring of data protection in the Lisbon Treaty and also the uh, establishment, the, bi uh, the binding uh, establishment of the Charter of uh, Fundamental Rights. There is now also data protection at the European level very clearly established within the EU law framework as a, as a, human, as a human right, as a fundamental right. And I think that, that basically brings up, uh, that, that, that has complicated uh, the relationship to, uh, to trade of the data protection framework at the EU level. So I think that really clearly brings, from a European perspective, uh, very sharply this question of what the relation of the EU charter to possible trade agreements is and a possible inclusion of cross-border data flow provisions in impossible agreements uh, such as like will have been proposed in particular by the United States to include cross-border data flow provisions within TTIP or the trade and services agreement. So I think that is really like one of the really big questions to watch also internally for the EU how to resolve that the tension while like maybe the data protection framework was very friendly and oriented towards establishing conditions for cross-border data flow, the, the now this complicating factor uh, of uh, EU fundamental right to data protection and, and the charter and the way that is going to play out. 
so on Europe as a unity in relation with the US, <coughs> I think actually the idea of Europe as a unity, perhaps that is actually the idea of Europe in a, in a unity, that's, that's maybe perhaps exactly what, how you would start framing things or looking at things from, from a trade perspective. But if you look at major issues, uh, also and major issues, also it, the contentious issues in, in the US-EU relationship, I think there's maybe actually within Europe not, not even that much of an agreement. And I've done some recent work uh, looking at the um, uh, widely discussed data retention case and the right to be forgotten case and also um, issues of transnational surveillance, you see actually that within, the Europe, within Europe there's actually really not that much of a unity. And um, if you look at, for instance, the right to be forgotten, and then more specifically, the policy issue of how to address privacy and reputational harms online, um, you see actually uh, maybe there's a projection of an image of, of unity at the European level, but if you look at actually the different IDs in the, def if in the dif different national legal cultures of how to balance privacy and freedom of expression in these contexts, there's actually a lot of, there are a lot of differences. If you look at the debate about transnational surveillance um, uh, uh, through cloud computing and uh, the, how to address these kind of uh, issues from a European perspective, you also see in particular because this plays into national security uh, uh, type of interests which are not harmonized at the European level that uh, it's really not that clear that Europe and the European Union platform can formulate the right answers to address these kind of issues. So f to, um, to close, I want to say a few things about this growing divide about bal balancing privacy and freedom of expression. And Margot has already said uh, some, uh, made some very interesting remarks about that. I think the way I'm, I'm currently looking at this, like, there's this growing divide in a way like the US, the First Amendment is, is has, has led to let's say like interpretation of the First Amendment is, is leading to interpretations that basically uh, amount to looking at data as speech and the regulation of, of that being kind of suspect and the First Amendment uh, being a trump against any kind of regulation of, of data also in view of, of, of privacy uh, interest. In, in Europe, what you actually see is that data protection is, is really, is, being established and formulated and operationalized as this comprehensive, uh, comprehensively applicable framework to all sorts of data processing, personal data processing, and is becoming actually the, the, the main instrument, one of the main instruments to achieve a balance between privacy and freedom of expression. Uh, so not freedom of expression being an exception to the applicability of that framework, but achieving that balance within. Uh, the framework itself, and I think the Google Spain ruling is a really excellent example uh, of how this uh, how this has started uh, to to develop. Um, just to to have one final remark about, which is in relation to this specific issue of how to address privacy and reputational harms online, um, the right to be forgotten would would clearly not work from a U.S. legal perspective. It would be uh, constitutionally invalid because of the First Amendment. There, similarly, there's a provision that has been enforced in the U.S. for almost two decades now, which is the Communications Decency Act, Section 230, which provides absolute immunity to uh, intermediaries of all sorts with respect to these kinds of privacy and reputational harms. That 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 kind of provision would clearly not uh, uh, be valid from a European perspective. So I think, I think though, like, so there, this privacy and reputational harm, maybe you can kind of single that out to say, okay, that is really something where Europe and, and the US are disagreeing. Uh, but I think that um, the underlying development of, of data protection is this ever more comprehensive framework uh, also to achieve the balance between privacy and the free flow of information more generally. And in the US, the First Amendment increasingly developing as this Trump against any kind of sort of regulation. And, and recently, I think Chris Hoofnagel also wrote something, he's in the audience, something very interesting about the First Amendment also would be able to act as a Trump against uh, use regulation, like a shift from collection regulation to use regulation in the US.
I think that is something that um, is gonna uh, is gonna play out um, still uh, quite a lot in this US EU uh, interface. So with that, I think I finished my time and Fred make Frederick very happy and I look forward to having <laughs> virtual discussion. Thank you very much, Joris, and again for your ease and tighter time management. Perfect eight minutes. <laughs> um, hey, and look, uh, new panel members flying in all the time. <laughs> uh, welcome, Dennis. Uh, Professor Dennis Heers joined us. So now the um, Division Europe, uh, US is even more balanced on this stage. Uh, Dennis Hirsch is a law professor at Capital University Law School. He teaches, among other topics, information privacy law and environmental law. And he regularly spends time in Europe as well, like a few years ago, as a uh, uh, fellow at the Institute for Information Law, where he conducted research on Dutch and European data protection law. Welcome, Dennis. Um, you're just in time um, to hear Pierre, Luigi, and uh, David present. Uh, who takes the mic? Thank you very much, Frederick, and, and welcome again, Dennis. The presentations from Margot and Joris set up very well the work that Pierre, Luigi, and I have been doing together now for approximately the past year. We have looked at the goal of how can we find a way to make cross-border data flows a manageable practical reality without sacrificing the sub important substantive norms which underlie each nation's sovereign rights. And I think the conclusion that our work comes to is that substantive convergence as pertains privacy choices is not really practical in this space, at least not in the near term, but that there are sufficient similarities among the US and EU systems to consider procedural convergence with the goal of reducing the transaction costs to organizations, of engaging in compliance across national borders without forcing the nations to give up those sovereign rights. And we adopt sort of what, uh, an approach we call supervised market-based regulation, which we're going to tell you a little bit about. Based on the idea that while the systems in the EU and the US have some differences, and there certainly is a greater focus in the US on intrusions by the government than the US focuses on intrusions by private or corporate actors. And the EU certainly focuses more on intrusions by corporate actors than does the United States. Both systems share a feared outcome of the chilling effects on action and speech. And from this, we propose that this shared fear is sufficient to support a market-based approach striving for common procedural compliance mechanisms. And Pierre Luigi is going to talk a little bit about the background of how we got there. Yeah. Thank you, David. And thank you, David and Margot, for organizing this panel. Uh, we started in our paper, and uh, I thank you all the audience for uh, coming here. We are waiting for a critics or suggestion about our ideas. We started from considering the different uh, uh, administrative state, the role of the administrative states uh, in uh, the idea of privacy between US and EU. If we look at the administrative states in the US, for example, from the beginning, uh, all US citizens uh, consider the state as a self-limiting entity and they are, f uh, and they are mm, against uh, unrestrained state action. 
The European Union is very different, as you know, as, as Joris has just said. Uh, the European Union, using the word of the European Court of Justice, constitutes a new legal order of international law, for benefit of which the state have limited their sovereign rights, albeit within limited fields, and subjects of which comprise not only member states, but also their national. So we have not a real federal state like in the US, but we have a bunch of states uh, with a new legal order, uh, that, and there is no the perception of uh, EU citizen against the administrative state like in the US, but we are more fear about private companies, especially if they are US companies collecting personal data of European citizens that we don't know how they are processed because uh, you know, the safe harbor agreement is just a sort of certification used to say that the US companies are uh, accomplished the objectives of the um, uh, European privacy regulation, but we don't know how they accomplish the goals of the privacy regulation. And uh, starting from this difference, we find a common, uh, um, a common root on the chilling effects exercising, for example, freedom of expression, if you know that uh, your privacy rights are in danger. And this is the same in the US and the EU. Uh, we um, believe that uh, this is the main uh, uh, argument to find a common regulation between US and EU, and this is to avoid chilling effects, and uh, we find the possibility to avoid this chilling effect using this uh, instrument, which is the supervised market-based regula regulatory delegation system. And uh, I have just one quote by Professor Whitman. Uh, he wrote a paper about the two Western culture of privacy, saying that it would be wrong to say that there is some absolute difference between American and continental European law. But the issue is not whether there is an absolute difference. Our differences are only relative, but they are no less profoundly for that. American and Europeans arrive at, arrive at the same conclusion. Nonetheless, they have different starting point and different ultimate understanding of what counts as just societies. Because as said by Professor Post in the Mm, paper three concept of privacy, while continental privacy protection is a form of protection of personal dignity, and you find this also in the European directive, American privacy protection is a form of protection of personal liberty. So we have very different starting point, but we are not far from uh, reaching a common way to regulate privacy. So this concept of a highly heterogeneous set of values, but some commonalities is not without some degree of history. And the example of the healthcare system in the United States is similar in the regard that it is incredibly heterogeneous with many parties that substantially disagree with one another, but has this common goal in theory of providing healthcare. To regulate within that sector, the U United States legislatures adopted a method of developing regulations called management-based regulatory delegation. Seeing this similarity, Pierre Luigi and I are looking to apply a similar concept and develop this supervised market-based regulation. Instead of using highly precise compliance rules, rather the regulator lays out general principles, what are the goals? And then the regulated entities, in this case, private companies which process data, become responsible for developing their own compliance plans, adhering to those compliance plans, and making sure that the compliance plans reasonably address the general principles. So develop a plan, follow it, and make sure that it's reasonable. From this, we propose an approach under which the market could effectively implement this sort of supervised regulation. If the member nations agree that if you, regulated entities, all follow a common set 
of procedures for developing your plans. It would tremendously reduce the compliance burden on organizations because they can develop the same plan for each, they can use the same procedure to develop a plan for each nation. Each nation would retain their sovereign rights to define what would be the general principles. So if I go to Italy and I want to conduct business and process data in Italy, I must adapt my plan to the Italian Data Protection Authority. But I can use the same plan development process and my plan may already be well underway, so only small differences are necessary to reach it. And then each nation and Data Protection Authority or its regulator evaluates the compliance. And they evaluate the compliance not based again on this highly precise list which can create tremendous regulatory complexity, but based on whether you followed this plan, whether you developed it, whether you followed it, and whether it reasonably addresses the general principles laid out for your nation. Now what's interesting about this method of regulation, at least as we've seen it unfold in the United States, is that the process of going through developing the plan and the sort of looming threat in the background that the state may highly precisely regulate if you don't develop good plans, the legislatures might change their minds caused organizations to do far, far better at the, this was information security, data protection where this happened, far, far better than any of the highly regulated, precisely regulated industries. So there's something which comes out of the idea of having this conversation and developing the plans. The exercise itself moves organizations forward and this is based on the fact that in nearly all the cases of enforcement, the enforcement was not because the regulated entity failed to reasonably address the general principles, but rather it was because the regulated entity didn't have a plan at all or they didn't follow their plan. The organizations which developed the plans and followed them were far, far ahead of the game. And we propose that this can be applied to privacy as well. And Pierre Luigi is going to say a little bit more about how in a market-based system actors would be incentivized to work with this. Yeah. <clears throat> we believe that the market uh, implementing the management-based regulation delegation is uh, a system that could work because they use a bottom-up approach, starting from the market and regulating uh, how the personal data flow across the companies and across the nation. Uh, and if you look, for example, staying in Europe, uh, the activity of the data protection authorities or also the activity of the European data protection authorities, every sort of decision is now made uh, taking uh, meetings with the stakeholders, uh, asking to the market which is the best way to reach some goals. So we have a recent example for, uh, with the uh, Article 29 Working Party on uh, right to be forgotten. All the decision and the principles on the right to be forgotten were shared first with uh, the companies, the internet companies. And uh, in a lot of documents from European Commission, you find the need to uh, involve the European companies in decision and in uh, defining the rules for privacy regulation. And uh, uh, we believe that this uh, system could be uh, useful because uh, <coughs> First of all, the system is general faster than using the tailored treaties uh, or other international law instruments. And uh, in this sense, probably the uh, European data protection reform is a good example how the law and the politics can be stuck in discussing how to regulate privacy without coming to uh, an end uh, in a uh, short time. And uh, um, it's important also to see that the users uh, can have a direct role and influence the choice of the market. And this is important because the users are the personal who own the, their personal data and uh, it's important to uh, give them the possibility to express uh, their ideas. And uh, uh, there is a possibility to adopt the market-based regulation delegation worldwide independently from the legal system that we consider. Thank you all very much for the opportunity to discuss this proposal. We would eagerly welcome your feedback and that of our fellow panelists. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Frederick.
Thank you very much, Pierre, Luigi, and David. Um, again, welcome to Dennis, now installed. And um, now we turn the floor or the mic to uh, Eduardo. Thank you very much, and good morning. So, there is one key ingredient in this EU-US data interface, safe harbor. Safe harbor, which for some people is perhaps the best thing that ever happened to privacy in the US because it brought European concepts to US-based multinationals. For other people, it's just an out-of-jail type card for US companies to get data from Europe without having to do too much. The truth from what I see and what I've seen over the years is that it's probably neither of those, of those things. What it is, is a tool. Safe Harbor is a tool, it's a, it's a trade tool, which frankly exists in order to deal with what is a slightly absurd legal prohibition. There is a prohibition in the law in the 21st century that actually bans data flows from Europe to other countries. It's a prohibition in the world in which we live today. Aside from the policy rationale behind that, from a factual point of view, it is absurd. So let me share with you some, some views uh, and some observations of my experience of Safe Harbor to see if this adds a bit to, to the debate. First of all, Safe Harbor was drafted by the US Department of Commerce. We've heard a little bit about the different approaches and the different traditions between the US and Europe. This came from the US. It's not, it wasn't drafted here in Brussels. So therefore, don't expect to see the directive and the language of the, the, that we use in Europe. It was drafted by, uh, on the other side of the Atlantic. In the same way, Canadian law was drafted by Canadians, and Mexican law was drafted by, by Mexicans. And apparently those laws are good enough for Europe. The EU is having an unprecedented opportunity to have a second bite of the cherry. It is the only time I, I've seen where the EU and the European Commission is formally and actively, extremely actively, reassessing the adequacy of a system that had already been granted an adequacy decision, an adequacy finding. So the work is, is going on. But in my view, don't expect to see radical changes. Because again, there wasn't much room for discussion the first time around, and there isn't much room for discussion this time around. What is important, of course, is relevant there, is what the Court of Justice of the European Union may say about this topic in a few months or, or a year or so. In the case that has, re has been referred by the Irish High Court, which effectively is questioning, it's a very simple question. Should, in this case, the Irish Data Protection Commissioner or any other European Data Protection Authority for that matter, blindly accept the adequacy given to Safe Harbor, or is that authority entitled to challenge that, and therefore, even if a recipient of data is a member of Safe Harbor, still deem the transfer not to be adequate? Simple question. We'll know the answer in about a year from now, but if you think a bit about it, and I know many people here have read decisions by the Court of Justice in recent times, data retention, right to erasure, CCTV, and not, being, um, not fitting within the domestic exemption. What kind of line is the, C 
is the court of justice taking? I think it's quite telling. So not making predictions here, but uh, we'll see what the, see, uh, what the court of justice will say. What it will not say, by the way, is it will not say safe harbor is no longer adequate because that's the competence of the European Commission. But it, will, it, it may say, you data protection authorities, you have the discretion to judge whether a particular transfer is adequate, even if it's based on safe harbor. And just to get technical for a second, I, I think there is one technical drawback with safe harbor. When it was drafted so many years ago, we, it was, data protection in Europe was not as sophisticated in terms of the amount of thinking that has gone into it as, it as it is now. Safe Harbor was drafted with a controller to controller type of data transfer in mind. Safe Harbor, when you read it, is for controllers. That's how it was drafted. But it is actually more useful for processors in practice. So there is a, a sort of a, an element there of a technical drawback in the way it was drafted that is, in my view, having a, an adverse effect in the way it can actually be used to receive data in, your, in a capacity as, as a service provider. So that's something that perhaps this exists ongoing review could, could address. But let me um, finish with one point. Safe Harbor and the outcome of the review and what it says and whether it is good or bad is what it is is irrelevant. It's absolutely irrelevant to mass state surveillance. Because whether a company is in or out, state surveillance will happen. Whether a company is using Safe Harbor or model clauses or BCR, safe mass surveillance will happen or not happen. It's nothing to do with a technical trade tool that was, was enacted or, or passed to address a very specific legal issue that, has, that is not directly related to state surveillance. Dealing with state surveillance is, just, is a political issue and, and it, it will have to be dealt with through political reform, not by the European Commission and the US Department of Commerce trying to negotiate a trade agreement or a trade tool. So those are my thoughts on uh, what uh, is proving to be a, a controversial uh, legal mechanism, but um, hopefully it will uh, continue to, to exist as a valid le legal mechanism to enable transfers uh, and overcome the limitations on, on this provision. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eduardo. And again, thank you for your impeccable time management. I always like it when I hear legal rules being called absurd. It's always fun. Um, now we um, turn to the freshly flown in uh, professor here, Dennis. So uh, with the first slide, the, the next slide, uh, Frederick, my, I have a, a fairly simple thesis, which is that sector-based uh, codes of conduct, that is sector-based co-regulation, has the potential um, to serve as a vehicle for global or nearly global privacy rules, and so to address some of the issues that we confront as data increasingly moves around the globe. As has probably already been mentioned, uh, we need global privacy rules or something approximating them because data moves so dynamically uh, in so many different ways today and does not respect national borders or regional borders. That leads to pri problems for privacy protection, 
because it's difficult to know where data is and what legal regime applies to it and whether that legal regime is being violated and whether that legal regime is being enforced. And it also uh, creates additional costs for business and hurts competitiveness because companies also need to know where data is at any given time, what law applies to it, and whether they are in compliance with those laws. So it's, it's not good for privacy protection. It's not good for business to have so many disparate privacy regimes when data is flowing from one area to another. Um, back up, yeah. So how to create global privacy rules? I think that's really a question at bottom of regulatory design. And when you think about designing a regulatory scheme, there are two fundamental questions that one has to address. One, who is going to do the regulation? And number two, at what level will that regulation be done? Um, so in terms of who's going to be doing the regulation, um, we have three options. It can be direct government regulation. Government establishes the standards and enforces them. It can be industry self-regulation. Industry establishes the standards and monitors and to some extent enforces them without government involvement. Or third, it can be co-regulation in which government and industry work intentionally and cooperatively, cooperatively together to develop the standards and enforce them. So if we look at the various regulatory initiatives, most of them fall into one of these three boxes. And then on the other dimension, at what level do we regulate? At the level of the firm, at the level of the sector, or at the level of the economy as a whole? Okay. So, Let's start with direct government regulation. How could you achieve global privacy rules through direct government regulation? Well, you could have a treaty um, that is then implemented through national laws and becomes binding on the data processors. And this or some version of this is what I understand Professor Reidenberg, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today, to be proposing. Um, an international treaty that would establish some baseline global privacy rules. Um, I think that's a very difficult goal to achieve. Uh, it's always difficult to negotiate a multilateral treaty. It's especially difficult where the countries at issue may have different fundamental values about the issue. Uh, as is the case in privacy, defi different definitions, different sense of what the importance of privacy is. So I'm not optimistic about negotiating such a treaty. In addition, regulatory theory tells us that direct government regulation is at its least effective when it is dealing with rapidly evolving areas of the economy. It's very hard for regulators to keep up with the new developments, understand the new technologies. And regulation through direct government regulation takes time. There's processes that must be followed. And when you have a rapidly moving uh, target, the, those regulations can be very quickly rendered obsolete by changing circumstances. So, both as a practical matter and as a theoretical matter, I don't think that direct government regulation offers us a very good choice here. The next option is self-regulation. So here you have industry which understands the technologies and how the business is development, developing. It can keep up much more quickly with fast-changing uh, business realities. Uh, and bring that knowledge to bear in the standards that it designed so you have a more informed and perhaps more intelligent 
set of standards. Um, so it, it addresses some of the problems of direct government regulation. However, it brings its own problems, including uh, that business often has an incentive to be more lenient with itself uh, and to prioritize its interests first. Um, and, uh, and the experience that we've had uh, in this area suggests that monitoring and enforcement can also be an issue. We have uh, this, this does exist today. At the level of the firm, we have um, multinational corporations have privacy policies that are voluntary, self-regulatory, and they apply them throughout their operations. That's a set of global privacy rules at the firm level. Um, we haven't seen it at the sector level, although uh, that I'm aware of, although we do see it in certain nations. Uh, I'm thinking of the Network Advertising Initiative uh, for behavioral advertisers in the U.S. voluntary guidelines at the level of the sector. Um, one of the other problems with self-regulation here is that it does not guarantee compliance with the law. It does not create a safe harbor. And so it doesn't address one of the fundamental problems of having so many disparate global privacy or disparate national and regional privacy regimes um, in that it doesn't guarantee compliance with them. So the companies still need to track where their data is, what the legal regime is in that area, and, and what they need to do to comply with it. It doesn't address that fundamental problem. Um, and we can see this with the ICX code, which was developed as an economy-wide code uh, on the theory that those who complied with it would be in compliance would be adequate for the purposes of Article 25. Uh, the problem was they never were able to get the Article 29 working group to approve uh, their code, and so virtually no one signed up for it, um, and we don't uh, talk about it much anymore. So I think that's another problem with self-regulation. It doesn't create the safe harbor, and the ICX code is a demonstration. Co-regulation has the um, the business knowledge of self-regulation, uh, the, the knowledge of the, of the technology of where the industry is going. It has buy-in from the regulated industry because they participate in shaping the rules. And it has some of the accountability of direct regulation because government regulators must approve the rules are, and are involved in negotiating and forming them. So it it addresses some of the weaknesses of the other two types of regulation. It has weaknesses of its own. I don't think that it's as adaptable as self-regulation is because once government and, 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 and industry reach an agreement, um, we have seen uh, in the context of the Dutch codes of conduct that they're very reluctant to reopen. But it does have some other virtues and that's why I think most of the solutions today for cross-border privacy rules employ co-regulation. Let's look at binding corporate rules, right? Negotiated between the company and, um, and the regulators. Um, APEC cross-border privacy rules has to be approved by a representative of the regulator, the accountability agent. Uh, the EU US safe harbor. Uh, again, you know, there's, there's a certain level of regulatory approval of the, the basic parameters for what a, um, wh what a company policy must be. So these are all co-regulatory in nature. Um, the problem with them, I, I think, is that they operate at the level of the firm. That's why they're in the top box there. Um, it's a company, usually a multinational company, that will negotiate a binding corporate rule and that's a very expensive endeavor and the high transaction costs and very few companies are actually capable of doing that. And, and I think that's exactly what you see with BCRs. It's the big companies that are able to undertake these transaction costs and get this flexibility um, and mid-sized and small cannot. Uh, so that's, that's one problem with, with these. And also they, as I understand it, BCRs create adequacy for cross-border transfers, but they don't create necessarily a safe harbor with respect to each EU 
member state law. So, so there's a problem there. I'm gonna, I, I'm almost done here. I'm, I'm uh, running out of time. Okay. Uh, the proposed approach is to use um, co-regulation at the level of the sector, not of the firm. And if you do it at the level of the sector, the sector proposes a code to the regulators who negotiate it and approve it, then individual companies can pool their resources. Um, and they can, uh, you know, it's, many more companies can participate. It's not just uh, the largest corporations that can afford to do it. Um, it still retains the ability to tailor the code to the realities of an industry, an economy-wide approach wouldn't do that, but the sector level still has the tailoring function and it allows many more companies um, to participate. So uh, I, I think that is the solution and very briefly to conclude, the legal mechanisms to implement it already exist under Article 27 of the 1995 Directive and industry sector could propose a community code to the Article 29 working group if they approve it, that would create a safe harbor for all of the EU. They could take the same code and bring it to the APEX system, have it approved by an accountability, uh, accountability agent, and it would create a quasi-safe harbor for the APEX countries, including the United States. So if you had a single code twice approved, one in the EU, one in APEX, you would have something approximating global privacy rules. And if you did that on a sector by sector basis, you'd have tailored rules that were open to many companies. And I think that may provide us with the best opportunity for, in the current regime, creating something approximating global privacy rules. Thank you very much, Dennis. Um, very sharp, although you could just come running from a flight. Thank you indeed. Um, now we're going to turn to the audience. I'll take a few questions. Please be um, brief and concise, and also mention whether your question is uh, uh, especially for one of the members, or is it uh, for the panel as a whole. I'll take a few questions, and then we'll uh, do a round of answers, and hopefully we have the time for another round, public panel. Um, I. Uh, the people walking around with them, uh, let me, it's really hard to see something for me. I see an arm here, and am I going? Uh, um, hi. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm Mark de Klein from the University of Amsterdam. Um, thanks for the interesting talks. Um, I saw um, recently a presentation of Casper Bowden. Uh, he's also here, but I guess not in this room, but in one of the others I saw on Twitter. Um, he spoke about the cloud conspiracy and about uh, the FISA 702 article in the United States. Um, how do you think it would influence the interface between the European Union and the United States? Uh, good and challenging question. I'm looking forward to the panel members' reactions. Um, ah, one more. Hello, um, my question is to the whole panel. My name is Kalin Svetkov. I represent Working Group 11. So my question is in terms of applicable law, imagine the following situation. We have a data subject in Europe uh, who has given his prior consent for processing. And uh, of course, in this consent is uh, included that the data can be transferred. It is transferred to US. And in, let's say, in a few months, the data subject uh, sends a notice that uh, he wants to withdraw the consent for processing. Uh, but the US data controller, let's say a search engine or a data broker, uh, denies to comply with the consent. So uh, what happens? Is it the processing legal after the notice? And that's the question. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, is somebody else standing? It's really hard to see for me. Yeah, one more. There, one. Okay, yes. So uh, I'm Lar Ballard. I'm with the U.S. State Department. And I, I have a question for uh, Joris about right to be forgotten just because I know he's so thoughtful on the topic. Um, when you talk about its incompatibility with U.S. law and with U.S. notions of free expression, are you talking about the European Commission's 2012 legislative proposal on right to be forgotten, which does seem to dictate deletion of content? Or are you talking about the ECJ decision in Google versus Spain, which is an interpretation of the 95 directive, 
uh, in which the way it handled free expression issues is probably largely a function of its procedural posture and the free expression arguments that may or may not have been put before that court. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to give, uh, we have nine minutes left. <laughs> I'm going to give the panel members a um, sh uh, short possibility to react. And um, um, I promise in name of the panel members, without negotiating with them, that you can come up later after the panel to them as well to discuss further. Um, I'm going to use the order that we used uh, for the first remarks. So, Margot, a reaction to the public? Sure. So, I actually, I just want to focus on the first question about FISA 702. Um, I think the question is actually not will it uh, affect the EU-US interface, but how has it already affected the EU-US interface? Um, at the, the very early stages of TTIP discussions, uh, there were a number of EU representatives who stated publicly that they would withdraw from trade agreement negotiations because of the existence of NSA surveillance. Um, and I think that that stance has since been uh, modified pretty significantly. But I think the reason that EU representatives continuously say that data protection will not be in the TTIP is because they fear bad political reactions as a consequence of NSA surveillance. Um, now, that all that said, it's entirely a political discussion uh, in the sense that there is no way TTIP would actually address national security surveillance, um, but it has colored the conversation about private sector surveillance in really interesting ways. Thank you very much. Now we go to Joris. So I'll, I'll say something also, but like Kasper Bowden has this remarkable ability to be present on almost every panel at CPD, uh, CPDP, usually it's like kind of funny, but so I did actually some work of, on uh, on the pr provision 702 and and looking at the that cl uh, the possibility of the use of 702 to do transnational surveillance of the cloud and then looking at that from a European perspective. What I mentioned earlier in my remarks, what is very interesting about that is that from a Europe, like to formulate an answer to that at the European level. Um, is, is hard because of the fact that 702 is a national security uh, sphere type of provision. So if you look at the, if you look at the, the problem of, of transnational su uh, surveillance of, uh, by intelligence agency, that is actually as much also an inter-European uh, country issue uh, as is also il illustrated by some of the leaks of the activities of GCHQ uh, oriented towards uh, towards Belgium and the institutions in uh, operating in operating in Belgium and in Brussels. Uh, so the the idea of formulating an answer at the European level, I think, is is very complicated, and I think that definitely also plays in uh, some of the of the Europe and U.S. Uh, um, uh, interface. You can actually see also that in a way the European Commission officials have have to stay, like they have to walk this fine line of actually not really having competency on this kind of issues. And I think that is like making them also sometimes much less effective in actually establishing protection at the European level. So I definitely think it, uh, it is relevant. On the, on the question of uh, my remarks about the incompatibility of the right to be forgotten in the, from a US perspective, um, yeah, I was mainly referring to the Google Spain ruling. Um, I think the uh, the proposals of the European Commission, they're, they're in a way much more broad. Uh, they are, they are I, actually, if you look at the actual proposals that were made by, by the European Commission in, the, in January 2012, the question of how that would, um, uh, what their impact on freedom of expression uh, could be or would be, uh, is uh, largely determined by other parts of the of the regulation, it's like how you interpret purpose limitation in the new in the new rules, and not necessarily that uh, ma a, mar a more explicit uh, assertion of of the right uh, to erasure itself. Um, so I think the question there of generally how that would survive under U.S. laws is a little bit uh, it's a little bit more open question. I think with respect to the way that uh, the court has decided. Uh, the Google Spain uh, ruling, I think it's much more clear uh, that that wouldn't uh, survive uh, uh, scrutiny under the First Amendment. The idea that like the actual content is not deleted, I've never found that a really convincing argument for the reason that there is actually stuff me being made accessible, maybe m made inaccessible, maybe in a search engine, but it's still, there's still like uh, a censorship of at the level of accessibility and findability and does it like 
So I, do, I don't necessarily feel that, the, that uh, the argument that there's not a freedom of expression problem is very convincing, even from the European perspective, but I'm qu quite sure from a US perspective that is even less, uh, even less convincing. Okay, thank you. And so just all the panel members. Uh, just a brief, very, please. very brief comment on the cloud point. I think, which I think, um, perhaps highlights the absurdity of trying to regulate data geographically. The cloud is just a, an expression of data globalization, which is w in the world in which we live. Um, and linked to that is again this idea of trying to create the European cloud that w I've heard before. I've I've seen companies uh, being receptive to message, to the message of we come as a service provider, we can provide a European cloud. These are companies, this is the, the customers of these European cloud providers are global companies that are precisely trying to access data globally. And therefore, uh, it seems like a bit of a, an, again, a strange situation to try to keep the data uh, locked geographically. I think Eduardo's point is very good, although I think at the same time we do need to respect the differential rights that some citizens may expect from their respective nations. And to the second question which was asked, that of what would happen to a request to stop processing or remove data from down the road once it has crossed borders. Um, I'm going to answer under Pierre Luigi's and my proposal. I think Pierre Luigi is going to offer some thoughts on how it would operate under existing law. Under our proposal, the idea would be that, for example, if Belgium has a rule that says you must honor requests to stop processing and delete data, then any multinational which, which wishes to operate in Belgium, however that might be defined, and maybe the easiest definition is Belgian citizens or those who Belgian law defines to enjoy those protections, if they want to process that data, they must incorporate that into their plan. One of the upsides for this is, well, they'd only be required to afford that right to Belgian covered uh, individuals. It brings it into the conversation for the multinational. And in my experience, at the very least, that can have a gradual effect of making privacy more of the conversation within the organization. So, Pierre Luigi. Yep. Um, if the process, uh, like in your example, was started correctly, and uh, there is a consent for the data flow to the United States, uh, I think that is applicable also the general clause, which uh, wh when you ask uh, something which is impossible or uh, involve disproportionate efforts, and this is a general clause in the data privacy law that we can consider. So, I I don't see any problem in uh, in this case. Um, Eduardo's point about data moving globally, it's not just multinationals, it's all kinds of companies today. And so we really need a regime to govern this, uh, both for privacy protection and for compliance. I know that there's no strict separation between surveillance and commercial use of personal data. However, I think it's important that we try to separate our discussions about whether we can come up with cross-border, and I actually think we need global privacy rules um, for privacy protection and for the information economy to function today. Um, and I'm concerned a little bit that the issue of surveillance, which is on so many of our minds, kind of takes over the discussion. And so I would encourage us, at least temporarily, to try and have that on two tracks um, I guess that's, that's my response to the question. Thank you very much, Dennis. Thank you, all the panel members. And thank you for the Yale Information Society Project to organizing this panel. Thank you for CPDP for organizing the whole conference. And most of all, thank you for joining our panel. <laughs>